Good evening. I would like to call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, October 11th, 2016. We will rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Jordan Wilson, Student Council President. We will remain standing for a moment of silent meditation in memory of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Our first item for this evening is our agenda. Are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda, Dr. Dance? There are none. Hearing none, is there a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Our next item is selection of speakers. Sign-up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at tonight's evening's meeting. Board practice limits the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled meeting to 10. Each speaker is allotted three meet minutes to discuss his or her issue. The completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in the box to my right, and the first 10 drawn from the box will be our speakers for tonight during the public comment portion of the meeting. If fewer than 10 sign-up cards are received, all who sign up will be permitted to speak. The first speaker is uh, Sundia Kaner, C-A-Y-N-U-R. Two. Second one, Desiree Kaner. Three. Third one, Atoya Hill. Four. Number four is Tanya Watts. Five. Number five is Elraine, either Bennett or Burnett. Six is Lily Lee. Seven. Number seven is Athena Zhao. Eight. Shannon Johnson. Nine. Number nine is Bosch Ferron. Ten. Number 10 is David Green. Thank you very much. <laughs> our next item on our meeting agenda is the superintendent's report. And for that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Dance. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Four uh, quick announcements um, as we go into our October meeting. Uh, first, I want to just recognize the fact that October is Principals Appreciation Month. And so we have 173 very strong, outstanding school leaders. We also have an amazing group of assistant principals who help them lead the day-to-day -day interactions within their schools. So just as we thank a teacher, we also thank a leader as well, too. We always say that principals are the most influential people in their buildings, but teachers are the most important. So I want to say a special thank you to our 173 principals principals within our school system and their assistant principals in their buildings. We just recognize the fact that we now have 20 national Blue Ribbon schools. Um, Hereford High School and George Washington Carver Center for Arts and Technology will be recognized in November by the United States Department of Education as being the 19th and the 20th Maryland Blue Ribbon, I should say National Blue Ribbon School for Baltimore County. But that brings our total to 23 Maryland Blue Ribbon schools. So congratulations to Carver and to Hereford High School for receiving the National Blue Ribbon uh, designation. I also want to say a special thank you to the Baltimore County Student Council and the Superintendent Student Advisory Group. Last week was Bullying Prevention Week, um, and there was a week of great activities uh, within our schools that culminated every single day with different colors that represented different adjectives that we wanted our students to, to live by. So the campaign, Be Smart, Don't Start, was highlighted very well on social media, but also categorized by BCPS TV as well. And last but not least, um, I want to talk a bit about grading and reporting. Um, and I want to thank our chief academic officer for her leadership. She came to me yesterday um, with the idea and a recommendation. I gladly uh, supported it. Uh, but let's go back. For two years now, our board has been working on the development of, or I should say revision, of policy 5210, which is our grading and reporting. And that policy had not been updated since the early 1970s. Hmm. Um, and as grading practices have evolved, as research has evolved around grading, um, the board 
board wanted to take a look into that. However, the board wanted us over the 15-16 school year to work with many stakeholders to determine what that policy would look like in action. It truly moved us to a mastery grading format. And when you are going to a mastery grading format, that's a huge cultural shift. And also, it takes massive professional development in order to make happen. Um, keeping my ear to the ground in terms of what our students, our high school students have given me a lot of feedback um, on our grading reporting policy. But I also know that our principals, our teachers, and our community have been giving us feedback as well. What uh, Ms. White is asked to do, though, is that over the next week to intensely meet with principals. Um, she sent an email out to principals today saying that she was going to do some informal sessions with the CAO to get some very valid feedback in terms of the opportunities and the benefits that we have with our policy, but also what are some things that we need to look at as we move forward with implementation. They will occur over the next five school days. I should say over the next eight school days as it goes into next week. Our community superintendents will also lead their school teams, though, as they do individual focus groups at schools with teachers and students and parents. Um, what I've asked Ms. White and what she uh, said she's willing to do is that they're going to take all of this back to the Grading and Reporting Steering Committee and form a recommendation for me um, prior to the end of the first quarter. So I want to thank you on record, uh, Verlita, for your leadership. I truly do appreciate it as our chief academic officer. As we move forward, though, we want to make sure that, that our students are at the center of why we, make the, uh, why we do the work that we're doing. However, at the same time, we want to be very clear that we don't have any issues where around grade inflation. Um, and so with mastery grading, you're truly grading students on the content, the curricula, and the material that we say they should know and be able to do. Um, so I do look forward to that, Verlita, but I also want to thank you publicly for your leader as chief academic officer. Um, and I know we're going to continue working not only with TAPCO, but also with CASE and our bargaining units as we move forward with implementation of board policy 5210. So with that, that concludes the superintendent's report. Thank you, Dr. Dance. <laughs> Our next item is the chair's report. Um, the Board of Education has been fortunate in recent weeks to receive an increased number of communications from parents and the community associated with several important topics to education in Baltimore County. Uh, perspectives on the heat policy and the new grading manual are two examples that have generated quite a bit of correspondence. An interesting observation, though, is that in both cases, many of the comments were a reaction to the issue after implementation. On November 9th, the Board of Education will make a decision regarding the calendar for the 2017-2018 school year. An opportunity for public comment on the calendar will be pro provided at the next board meeting on October 25th. In addition, interested persons may email their thoughts to the Board of Education at their email address that's displayed on the BCPS website. The board desires to incorporate the thoughts of our stakeholders when arriving at the calendar that best suits the educational needs of our students and families. I'm encouraging all to submit your thoughts prior to the vote on November 9th. As previously mentioned, the board received input over the summer months uh, from stakeholder groups regarding how the Board of Education meetings are conducted and offered suggestions for improvement. A board committee was established led by Mr. Stewart to examine the way we structure our meetings and uh, the committee will present their recommendations to the board in coming weeks. I want to publicly thank uh, Mr. Stewart for his very capable leadership as the board seeks to become more efficient and effective. Since our last board meeting, uh, members of the uh, board have had the opportunity to participate in conferences sponsored by the Council of Urban Boards of Education and the Maryland Association Boards of Education. Both conferences provided workshops that were opportunities to interact with other educational jurisdictions, hear ways to address common problems and challenges, and hear speakers that were uh, offered unique perspectives on educational topics. A common theme at both uh, meetings was equity. Across the country, school systems are examining how we create an environment where all students are able to maximize their ac academic achievement. Finally, I just want to address one administrative issue related to our board meetings. An incident occurred at the last board meeting during the public comment portion of the meeting that emphasized the importance of adhering to the three-minute limit for all speakers. The limitation is not in place to be rude to those speaking, but to be fair and equitable to all that speak and attend our meetings. For that reason, the three-minute limit will be strictly enforced. These are all my comments, and thank you for your attention. Our next 
item is our student board member report. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, it's been a very busy month since last time I've updated everyone. On September 20th, I did my first uh, official school visit at Charles Mott Elementary School and was really excited by what I saw. One of, the first, one of the things I was looking for when I went was how the devices were being used in the classes. And I, was in, and I was particularly impressed by the fourth grade class that I sat in on. The students were working on a health project on their devices and were using the different functions of the device to enhance their projects. So thank you to Mr. Roberts for accompanying me on my visit and to the principal, Ms. Aries, for her hospitality and the tour. Um, BCSC has also hosted its annual fall camp and I won't go into too much detail because our president is here and I'm sure she'll love to talk about that. Um, but one thing I did really want to talk about, because it's of particular importance to a lot of people, especially our students, is um, the concerns over the grading policy. I understand that change is hard, and um, no policy was going to be met without significant pushback. And after much consideration of the effect of the policy based on testimonies from other students and personal experience, I've identified two major areas that, see, that need immediate improvement. First is that it creates high-stakes high testing scenarios. With fewer assessments being considered as part of the body of evidence, there is now a larger emphasis on testing. Students with test anxiety, students who have a single day off, or students who don't understand one of the concepts being tested are all heavily penalized. We are approaching the end of a quarter, and a student reported that in the gradebook for one of their classes, they have three grades, two 10-point assignments, and one 100-point test, making that one test 83.3% of their grade. Other students have commented that they now plan to take lower level classes in an effort to protect their grades, despite feeling prepared to take higher level classes. One of the many ways to address this, I believe, is to implement a cap on the percent of a student's grade that can be comprised of non-reduable tests. The second main issue that I'm hearing over and over again is the inequitable implementation of the redo policy. Um, the majority, or the major focus of the grading policy was to promote consistency across classes, which is important. However, the new grading system has unfortunately been implemented in a disparate manner. One student commented that teachers do not seem to understand the new grading policy and as a result are implementing it differently. The redo policy in particular, in particular has caused issues as teachers do not know which assignments students can redo and how many times they can redo them which leads to obvious inconsistencies. Another student commented to me at the fall camp that his teacher would only allow redos before and after school, and as a bus rider, he was therefore unable to redo any of his assignments. Finally, I'd like to share a particularly upsetting comment I received from a student um, that said, quote, we haven't worked hard for our entire BCPS careers to find ourselves academically disadvantaged at such a critical time in our lives. The effect of your experimental pro policy with, has real and impactful and far-reaching results, which makes me question whether this county is willing to sacrifice us unlucky students' futures in the name of moving forward. So to conclude, I'm very hopeful um, in regards to the direction of the master grading policy, but I do hope that we can address some of the inherent problems with the implementation, and um, I'm very hopeful. So thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll move through the agenda to our public comment section of the meeting. This is one of the opportunities we provide to hear views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens and will take your comments into consideration. Even though it is not our practice to take action at this time on issues which are raised, when appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up. While we encourage public comment on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and school system, this is not the proper avenue to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing avenues of redress for complaints. I would like to remind the public that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask you to observe our timer behind me, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the bell or see that time has expired. At this time, we'll call, oh, I'll call uh, our first speaker from our stakeholder group, uh, Ms. Jordan Wilson, president of the Baltimore County Student Council. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. 
Uh, so as Aislin said, I am here to talk about our big event, which has happened, which is the Baltimore County Student Council's Fall Leadership Conference. Um, it is a three-day, two-night camp that we host at River Valley Ranch, and it basically is an opportunity for anybody in any Baltimore County student count or any Baltimore County public school, um, from grade seventh all the way through twelfth to come and learn team building, leadership skills, um, anything that could really help them out in the real world as well as in their own student councils if they are involved there. Um, so we had a ton of student leaders who worked with me and Ms. Murray, our advisor, to put together that event. And uh, it was just a really incredible year. Um, I think that that event is definitely by far my favorite, and I think a lot of the kids had a great time. Um, it is run by kids for kids, which we think is very unique and very special. And uh, we just really had a great time, learned a lot. I do want to say a special thank you to uh, Dr. Dance for your video that you prepared for us to welcome all the students that day. Um, they really liked seeing you there and liked seeing that you supported us. And also just a huge thank you to all the advisors and principals who came and support us along the way, um, because we do really appreciate all the support that we can get. Um, other than that, it was just a really fantastic event, and I look forward to seeing where it goes in future years, because we did have the opportunity to make a lot of cool changes with our new venue that we acquired last year. Um, other than that, we have our first Board of Education dinner coming up on the 25th, and we have 10 students selected who are really excited to come and get to talk to you guys about <laughs> different issues that we see in our schools. Um, we have a lot of new people on the board this year, and I think they're very excited to kind of get that first chance to meet you guys and also to uh, portray kind of what they see in their own specific schools. We tried to get a very diverse group to see different areas of the county and basically see all those different opinions. So thank you all for that opportunity. Um, I will see you guys on the 25th. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your leadership. Our next speaker is from TAC TABCO, uh, Ms. Roxanne Russo. Good evening, Chairman McDaniels, Vice Chairman Gillis, Dr. Dance, and members of the board. Abby Baton could not be here tonight. I am Roxanne Russo, a member of the TABCO Board of Directors, and have been asked to bring you Abby's message in her stead. We have heard from many of our teachers about the stress, confusion, and workload issues surrounding the grading and reporting pilot this year. I would like to thank our teachers for their willingness to share the issues they are experiencing with us and with the system. We have shared many of these concerns with BCPS officials and have been working together with the system to review the issues, to provide opportunities for improvement, to specifically address what is working and what needs to be changed as we move through the pilot. We, have, uh, we understand the need to update and work toward a new grading system. We need to make sure everyone understands the new system, that the system is fair, workable, and actually provides the necessary feedback to students and parents. We will be looking for specific actions to address these issues so we can have a grading and reporting system in BCPS that works for all students. At the same time, it must provide the necessary tools that allow our teachers to work effectively without added workload and confusion. We know that information will be coming out to teachers shortly explaining some of the assistance and guidance that will be implemented to help us move forward with this pilot. Thank you, Roxanne Russo, on behalf of Abby Baton, TABCO President. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Our next speaker is from our Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee, Hope Messenger Blayshack. I'm, I didn't pronounce that correct. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. McDaniels, uh, Mr. Gillis, Superintendent Dance, members of the board. On this beautiful night, I'd like to address the desperate need for staffing increases for our neurodiverse students and to promote Dyslexia Awareness Month. I'd like to thank the Office of Special Ed for their commitment to train special education teachers in Orton Gillingham. And we would appreciate the board's commitment as the Office of Special Ed continues to seek opportunities to enhance this training for special education teachers. I've seen some of the training sessions at Loyal, and I'm pleased that we've started walking down the path to a brighter future for students who need systematic 
Identifying these students as young as possible is critical for their individual academic success and the success of BCPS as a system. Committing to provide additional staffing to meet the needs of the nearly 20% of our student population with dyslexia is absolutely imperative. Additional staffing will enable our dyslexic students to thrive rather than merely survive. At the last board meeting, our vice chair, Ms. Pamela Guest, shared her story of her son, Dane, who was not identified with dyslexia until two months before his graduation. Ms. Eaton couldn't fathom how this could happen, but it does happen far too often, and this is how. Rather than receiving adequate remediation and appropriate services, students with dyslexia are simply pushed through the system. They learn to work to the point of perseverance, which can cause attention difficulties, frustration, and anxiety. School becomes a place of danger, mistrust, and hardship. Last night at CCAC, we hosted an excellent panel about um, anxiety in school, and we were pleased to welcome Dr. Tanya Hope of the Kennedy Krieger Institute, Dr. Hope Bear, the coordinator of school counseling, Dr. Heidi schreiber Pan, Ms. Gail Martin, social worker team leader, Ms. Lauren Weingard, school psychologist, and Ms. Melanie Martin, school counselor. We were thrilled to have so much support from the Office of Special Ed, especially Jean Considine and Rebecca Ryder, as well as the Office of Special Ed, community specialists, school psychologists, social workers, and community members. What we heard was concern about the lack of adequate resources for students with anxiety. One student in attendance heartbreakingly shared that her teacher's brush off her anxiety is looking for attention. And she humbly asked that somehow we could teach the staff at her school that her anxiety is real. Mm. CCAC encourages the board to increase staffing to the Office of Special Ed so that all of our students can learn to thrive and succeed. CCAC appreciates the advocacy by Dr. Dance and the board for the 60 full-time equivalencies. And we're grateful for the, f the 20 that we received throughout the end of the budget process, but we don't believe that our special needs students should suffer from the aftermath of budget cuts. Please increase staffing so that we can teach all neurodiverse BCPS students to pursue excellence in all aspects of their lives. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is from ESPBC, which is the Educational Support Professionals of Baltimore County, uh, Ms. Veronica Henderson. Thank you, and good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, I, I am Veronica Henderson, serving on the Board of Directors of ESPBC, and I, I'm here on behalf of President Lila Marinbloom, who was unable to be with you this evening. Um, it's just more of a, an opportunity to say hello and let you know that it is her desire that you know that we wish to serve as partners with you in the education of the students we all serve. Um, this is her first full year as president, so we have, I have uh, um, what was her bulletin that she handed out in August. I'll pass this around, feel free to, to share it. Um, she just wanted you to know that we'll be making the meetings and so you'll have an opportunity to, to see some faces that you'll be able to Usually I see you at the retirement dinner, that's, that's the biggie. Um, she also wants to let you know that we are very appreciative of the new uh, career ladder program that Baltimore County has uh, instituted for ESPs, and that's the Aspiring Business Leadership Program. Uh, a number of our constituents have enrolled in that program. Yours truly is in there. And we're just waiting to see what the end result would be. But uh, once again, just want to say thank you, let you know that we're here to partner with you, and have a good meeting. Thank you. Our next speaker is from AFSME, uh, Linda Jones and Michael, I can't read that last name, but I'm sure you'll introduce yourself when you, Fahey, Michael Fahey. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Chairman Dallas, um, McDaniels, um, Vice Chairman uh, Mr. Gillis and Dallas Dance and uh, members of the board. Um, I'm President Michael Fay, President of AFSME 434, and um, I'm here to introduce Linda Jones, who is a cafeteria worker, and she just wants to tell you about the impact of being part-time has on the cafeteria workers with regard to their medical information, or medical um, costs, okay. Good evening, my name's Linda Jones and I'm a food <coughs> service worker. This is my 17th year with the county. Um, I work 10 months, six and a half hours a day, same as the teachers do. And my question is that why are the teachers considered full-time 
and some of the cafeteria workers are considered part-time. The difference I've noticed is on the medical, for a teacher family plan, the same plan that I carry for my family, they pay 139 every paycheck. I pay 224.38 every paycheck because I'm considered part-time. I work same hours as the teachers, same 10 months, and I just think that that's not fair. We need to be equal across the board. Just wanted to add that a, a four-hour worker pays 565.92. Every paycheck. Every paycheck. So that's over $1,000 a month that a four-hour employee is paying for medical. Okay. Thank, thank, thank you for you. your time. Thank you. All right. We'll move into our public comment speakers. And our first speaker is Serdia Kainer. Good evening, board. Good evening. All right. I'm here uh, as a parent from the Wellwood uh, International Magnet School. Uh, I wanted to, to discuss the changes that are, um, that were brought to our attention at our first PTA meeting, which was last month. Um, we had the principal along with a director, I, I, don't, I can't remember where she was from, but um, they uh, introduced a new uh, program that was going to start at the elementary school. Um, they were kind of uh, veering away from the magnet program in general, and uh, a lot of parents were taken by surprise because it was never explained to us that um, this magnet program was going to end and the start would be 2017 school year. Um, so we had a lot of questions. A lot of the questions couldn't be answered because the, uh, the, the principal and the director didn't know themselves. They said it would take about a three, it would take three years to do a complete transition um, for the school to get certified. And uh, you know, they explained the new program, which I, I believe it was IB, IB magnet or something like that. Um, and, it, you know, the program itself seemed to be good, you know, as far as a change. But a lot of parents were upset because we, we, we brought into the notion that our kids would continue under this magnet program. Our kids are in French. So, you know, we had to sacrifice a lot through these school years um, with the instruction that they were given, a lot of time that we had to take personally to uh, give them extra uh, help because they lack in other areas because you know the the um, the time allotted is significant. Um, so when this was introduced to us, you know it, it, they didn't really have a uh, a plan to properly transition. Is that look? This is where it's going to be. It's going to start next school year and really it's nothing that we could do about it. Um, we thought it was unfair because uh, we asked them how did they get to this point and they, they explained to us that they did a, uh, a audit and from the audit they had this information that deemed it necessary that whatever they tested didn't work with our students. Um, but we had questions because we were concerned like, you know, how, what did you audit? What was the questions you asked? What was the information that you got? How did you compare it to other students or, you know, for that matter, other magnet schools? So with us really not having uh, a direct definitive answer, um, a lot of parents were angry. Um, you know, I have a daughter, she's in the fourth grade, but, um, and I know my time's about to end, so I just got one quick thing. So, you know, we're, we're pretty much looking for a solution, something that can be done to at least um, allow our kids to continue, and then maybe the program. You know, once that magnet school, uh, um, you know, the first grade is in, all right. Thank you. And if you have comments you want to leave with us, we can hang on. If you have written comments or anything, we can oh, take cool. that. Okay, okay thank, thank you. you. Our next speaker is Desiree Kainer. Okay. And I'm not sure how to avoid those, but if you have another parent from our school speaking to have it. Yeah, we, we can't refer it, defer, but uh, you can come back next time if you'd like. Okay. Thank you. Oh, well, if. Okay, 
I'm Desiree Gaynor, his wife. Good evening. Um, pretty much everything he said. My other concern was, um, as far as the middle school, we have a daughter that went to Wildwood as well, and she's now at Subbrook. Mm -hmm. And it's my understanding that the program at Subbrook is changing also next year. So one of my concerns is my daughter's only in fourth grade, and sh next year she'll be in the fifth grade in a whole different program. They, I understand they're still going to offer French to her, but it's not going to be in the immersion way that it is now that we really bought into. So my concern is, I know before um, the kids that left from Wellwood that applied to Subbrook, they auditioned for it. But it's, if they, from my understanding, if they passed the test, they would have gotten into Subbrook. Now, it's, from my understanding, it's just a lottery. So my concern is the sacrifice we made for those six years. Um, once they get to Subbrook, it's kind of like what is going to happen with the French. So like he said, we sacrificed a lot to get them into the French program. We had to give a lot of instruction. So we were wondering why it wasn't a way that they could grandfather it out as opposed to just saying next year it's over, like maybe start at the third grade and third, fourth, and fifth would finish out the program. And maybe the second, I'm not sure how they would do it, but we just thought it would be another way to do as far as grandfathering as opposed to just ending it. And, not, and they didn't ask the parents. We didn't know anything about it. So we just heard about it this year. So I would have thought they would have spoken to the parents to see, get their insight on the program or how we felt and not just going off of test scores or whatever the audit was, I'm not sure. We don't really have a lot of information to give you because they didn't have a lot of answers for us. And I'm not sure what avenue we need to go down to get additional answers. So okay. that was all I had to say. Thank, thank you for your comment. Um, our next speaker is Atoya Hill. Good evening. Good evening. I am also a parent of two children currently enrolled in the French Immersion Program at Wellwood International School in Pikesville. I am fully committed to the success of the Baltimore County Public School System, yet I am here tonight because I believe that violations have occurred within the strategic plan to build on the success of the school system coined Blueprint 2.0. In Dr. Dance's 2015 letter to Team BCPS, he stated that the success of this plan will continue to rest on the sustained community engagement. Blueprint 2.0, Goal 3, clearly states that every stakeholder will experience clear, timely, honest, transparent, and widely available communication about system initiatives and activities. A letter was sent home in May 2016 to parents indicating that the current French Immersion Program would be dissolved and replaced with an IB program at Wellwood International School. This new magnet program would begin in the fall of 2017, and the communication was not timely in that it was sent after a decision had been made. Communication has not been transparent or widely available about this new initiative. Information and data results used to make the decision were neither available nor accessible. These changes came without stakeholder input. As a dedicated parent, former PTA president, and active community member, I am specifically asking the board to evaluate the changes implemented to this program and recommend the following amendment to the 2017-2018 Magnet Program at Wellwood International School. I would like a grandfather clause for the students currently enrolled in the French Immersion Program to allow them to complete the program under the established curriculum. I also find the manner of this change to be insulting and a complete disregard to the BCPS Master Plan Executive Summary, which states, continued collaboration with parents to increase understanding, awareness, and engagement, and expand stakeholder participation in decision making and the educational process. I am respectfully asking that the board recommend a halt to any changes to the current French Immersion Program at Wellwood International until more research has been completed and proper collaboration with parents have been achieved. Thank you for taking the time to listen to my concerns. I do hope this will make a difference. Thank you, Ms. Hill. Our next speaker is Latanya Watts. Good afternoon, board. Hello. Uh, my concern is I am a parent of a child at Deer Park Elementary, 
and of course the incidents that has gone on here lately. I feel that the, um, there have been no provisions made for the children that were involved in that situation and that their rights were violated and nothing has, and I would like to un understand or know what will be done to change that and how it's going to be prevented from happening again in the future. I say, and I feel that since this is a public school, the decisions and actions that are incorporated or for this should be noted to us because we're not given any information, no, no clear communication, and I feel that our feelings are being disregarded. The behavior was inappropriate, and I know we're not getting into any specifics, but still, there's no communication, a letter sent out, and nothing else has been silent ever since. We are concerned because our kids are sent to school and we're supposed to, they're supposed to be protect, protected while they're there. They shouldn't be mocked or anything else, especially by an adult that they trust. And I feel that there was a lot of disregard for the kids and no answers, no clear resolve or anything. I know it's ongoing. I know y'all have policies and procedures you can't discuss with us, but still some kind of commu communication should have been given to the parents. None of us have been called in, just received a letter. We are aware of the situation, but we need more than that. That's not enough. And I thank you for listening to what I have to say. Thank you. Our next speaker is Elaine Burnett. Good evening. Good evening. I too am a family member of one of the children that Privacy Act was violated. Um, you spoke earlier about academic achievement. And my question is, how, how was that accomplished if you're allowing the teacher to go right back into the classroom of the students that she disrespected? Um, how are you ensuring the safety of the children? Is that teacher supervised now? Because clearly, as a teacher, she violated the Privacy Act by being alone in the classroom. So we don't know what's going on now, but we do know that she's still there. And again, as my sister stated, nothing has been done, no answers. It seems like the teacher's being protected and the students are being violated. That is all I have. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lily Lee. Thank you so much for giving me the chance. And first of all, my name is Lily, Lily Lee. And I want to say thank you for all the board members for your volunteer work. I did two years of PTA treasurer and, uh, and I have a full-time job. So to me, I feel like a PTA treasurer thing was uh, another full-time job. <laughs> and you, you most of you, to, um, to my understanding, you have a full-time job too. And it's much, much more work than PTA treasurer. So yeah, you put a lot of commitment. I did that, so I know so much work for you. Thank you so much. And uh, now, uh, today, I want to just like, you probably can guess what I'm going to say. Just a request for Lunar New Year holiday recognition with BCPS. And uh, I'm a member of CAPA of Baltimore County. And I wonder if a board can consider recognizing Lunar New Year by closing schools on 2017, Lunar New Year Eve. It's January 27th, Friday. And the 2018 Lunar New Year, that's another Friday, February 16th, 2018. So I have a sheet. You will see some pretty pictures, <laughs> give you some a little shiny stuff. So a little bit, uh, introduction of, a of a Lunar New Year. Uh, probably I'll just say a little bit. Uh, Lunar New Year, it's also called the Spring Festival. It's the most important festival in the East Asia. So actually, New Year starts from the first day of the first lunar month to the 15 days of that lunar month. So actually, it's 15 days. Day one to day 15th. Day one, it's called New Year. 15th day, it's called a Latin festival. People hold Latins. 
people from the, at the night. So all the lanterns fall over the city or the country. It's, it's a lot of lights in the, in the whole country. So that's in the whole East Asia. So it's kind of a little description of uh, Lunar New Year. And uh, the day before the New Year, it's called New Year Eve. It's just like uh, American Thanksgiving. It's a time all the family members are together, reun have the reun reunion, and uh, visiting friends and exchange gifts, and the waiting and the hope and the pray for the good new year. So that's a little, in, in, it's a description, a little, uh, a little description for the new year. So to us, the New Year Eve, it's a very important festival. It's emphasized the Chinese, and the, it's emphasized the family ties. It's almost as important as like a equivalent to the holiday and to Thanksgiving here. So, uh, so I wish that we can, we can have, we can recognize that the holiday uh, and the, uh, we kids in the school, we can celebrate this 5,000 year old East Asia tradition. And I believe Baltimore County Public Schools is very open to all the cultural diversities and uh, consider all the different ethnic, uh, ethnic traditions. And uh, if we are allowed to look at this one, and uh, our kids will be like, feel they are equal to other, other ethnic and identity. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Athena Zhao. Good, good evening, BOE officials. My name is Athena Zhao. I am eight years old and a third grade student of Pretty Boy Elementary School. I wish the board could put Lunar New Year as a school holiday because, first of all, this is a very important holiday in Asian culture I want to celebrate with my family. Secondly, this is my favorite holiday. My family and I always have delicious food and exchange <laughs> gifts. Third of all, I want my friends and classmates to know this holiday, and I'd like to tell them more about the holiday. So I'd like the holiday, Lunar New Year, in the school calendar. Please, please, please approve my request. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Athena, for your excellent testimony. <laughs> Our next uh, speaker is Shannon Johnson. <laughs> she was so cute, I'm about to start talking about Luna New Year. So that's not <laughs> what I'm up here for, OK? So my name is Shannon Johnson. I'm also a parent from Wellwood, and I'm echoing the same concerns that you heard um, before about the change to the, the uh, magnet program. The greatest concern is definitely the lack of input from the stakeholders. They sent out um, a survey that most parents didn't know what it was for and thought maybe it was the change of name. And so when they checked off international studies, they thought they were checking it off because, of course, our kids take French, so yeah, that would work. And then when we were told that the magnet program was ending, we were all shocked. Um, the next questions from parents were just why. So some of it was because of map math data. The French students, they said, had lower scores than their peers in the same school, but we were never showed those scores. We don't know what the differences are. My daughter has always exceeded the, the school and state map scores, so we had no um, you know, realization that anything was wrong. And then after that, we asked, well, well how will the French continue? And they said that we, it will still continue, but we're not sure how. We may use Middlebury. Then, well, how will you use it with first and second grade? We're not sure. Um, have teachers received professional development? No, not yet. So there's a lot of not yet, we're not sure, and then to be told that the IB program, which they described in these six tenants, that it's going to start next year, but they really didn't have a grasp, and we had a representative from the Magnet Programs Office as well as the principal of what the IB program was. There's no feeder school for an IB program, so if our students start it, they don't have anywhere to go, and they were saying that they wanted... Um, if they were hoping to get a grant for Windsor Mill, Middle, and for another elementary school, but they did not get that grant, so we don't have any feeder schools. So my thought is the same thing. Can we let these students who have done it, I have a third grader who reads her math problems in French to me, and she is doing very well, let them finish the program and then 
institute the IB program with fidelity, plan it out, train the teachers, and have it come in and be done well, as opposed to just changing it. I realize we're doing a lot of this for equity, which I'm a big proponent of, but there's no point of changing a program and then making everybody have equity to nothing if we don't really know how to put the IB program in, so, and Luna New Year. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Farone. Good evening to all. I really cannot compete with the two previous <laughs> ones. I mean, um, all right. So first of all, thank you all, especially Mr. Collins, for standing up for the First Amendment. I think that was really, truly, truly a very impressive uh, position last board meeting. Um, my question to you, and I read the letter, thank you, Mr. Chairman, the letter from Mr. Nussbaum. I'm not really a lawyer. I'm not pretending to be a lawyer. I don't want to be a lawyer. <laughs> but reading the letter reminds me with one famous criminal case, no name, it's way far west of the U.S. where it's sunshine and everybody is happy, where the person was accused of two murders and had a dream team, had a very clever lawyer, and got away. So reading the law, reading Mr. Nussbaum's letter, and reading the manual of the Board of Education, as a citizen, three boards in my belt, this is really split in here. Um, I believe it's illegal for the student to, to vote, regardless of the numbers. And the letter doesn't address the bias of one honorable board member, as I stated to you in the last board meeting. The calendar that is proposed to you, option A, B, and C. The C option is really a Trojan horse. One official of the school system in the calendar committee stated, let's open on Rosh Hashanah, so we have some data, some objective data, quote unquote, to justify the closure on the Jewish holidays. I think that's wrong. Because again, not really coming on a holiday only means the person wants to take off. In several of the calendar committee meetings, several members stated that many of the Jewish teachers asked their friends to come and join them in taking off on the Jewish holidays so the numbers would be inflated. This is really not fair. And you know that Muslim Americans are not going to be able to do the same. Mm. Not at all. So here is my proposal to you. Make one holiday, like Columbus Day, a diversity day. We respect all religions, all ethnicities. We open the schools on the Jewish holidays. We open the schools on the Muslim holidays. We open the schools on any other holidays except the federal or Comar holidays. And this way, our talk about diversity and inclusion becomes a reality. Otherwise, it's just lip service. Thank you. Our last speaker for the evening is uh, David Green. Good evening, everyone. I engaged in civil disobedience at the last board meeting. Here's what happened and why. I was in the overflow room watching on the monitor. A public commenter, commenter reached the three minute limit and the mic cut off. I couldn't hear and nor could anyone else that was listening on the internet. A minute went by. Uh, then I got up and I took 15 seconds and walked to the doorway here. And then I waited another 15 seconds to see if there was any sign that the, 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 the limit, the three minute limit would be enforced. I saw no such sign. I interrupted and I said, ma'am, your time is up. Five words, just loud enough so everyone in the room could hear it. Why did I do this? There are two reasons. One is this is a public meeting. Most of the people that were listening on the internet in the back of this room couldn't hear. That's unacceptable. Second, this board has been very inconsistent about enforcing the three-minute rule, and it's about time for some fairness and predictability. 
Mr. McDaniel, I'd like to praise you because you, you were criticized in that meeting, but you came to the conclusion that I hoped you would come to. You said we will have to adhere to our three minute guideline just to be fair to all of our people. And then you said, we, when we begin to extend and vary our rules, we all get ourselves in trouble. That's very true. Um, and I'd just like to say that of all the four or five previous chairs, I kind of think you're at or near the top because you're calm and unflappable even, even when you're unfairly criticized. You listen well and empathetically to people who challenge and disagree with you. And you have a pretty good batting average for doing and saying the right thing when there is conflict. The issue of what I did, however, was framed uh, by many on the board as rude and outrageous to the speaker. I was speaking not to the speaker, but to the board, every, every person on the board. And I already apologized to her tonight uh, to say that if I embarrassed her or made her uncomfortable, I was sorry and apologized for that. Uh, Mr. Collins responded in a way that I thought was actually more rude and outrageous than, than I said. I'm not going to repeat what he said, um, uh, but I'd like you to go back and listen to what you said and compare it to my words. And I won't, I won't s repeat the rudest thing, but I'd like you to think hard about the words you said when you said, um, like you always do about everything. I'd su I suggest to you never say never and never say always. That said, I'm glad you're on the board, Mr. Collins, because you're one of the very few uh, members who ask hard questions and raises important but difficult issues. Uh, so where, do we, where are we left with this? Well, this, this issue is a symptom of uh, the three-minute rule of bigger things. And I had many other examples of, of where the rules are not clear or they're not enforced uh, uh, fairly. And every single other speaker tonight gave me examples of that. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Our next uh, meeting agenda item is new business, uh, personnel matters. For that, I'll ask Dr. Mayo to come forward. Daniels, Vice Chairman Gillis, Dr. Dance, members of the board. I'd like board consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, leaves of absence, certificated appointments, and Area Education Advisory Council appointments. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. Uh, do I have a motion to approve exhibits I-1 through I-5? So moved. Is there a second? It's been moved and second. Is there any discussion? If not, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. Our next item is uh, administrative appointments and uh, call for Dr. Dance on that one. Chairman McDaniels and members of the board, I would like to bring forward for your approval the following administrative appointments. Coordinator of Data Strategy in the Department of Research, Accountability, and Assessment. Manager of School Safety in the Department of School Safety. Senior Operations Supervisor in the Department of Building Services and Specialist of Literacy, Pre-K through 12 in the Office of English Language Arts. Thank you, Dr. Dance. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit J? So moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and second. Is there any discussion? If not, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. would like to introduce two individuals who are already members of our team who are being promoted tonight. First is for the Senior Operations Supervisor position in the Office of Operations and Building Services. Currently, right now, a field representative in that office. That's Michael Brown. <laughs> and Michael, do you have any family or friends here with you tonight? <laughs> Congratulations on your promotion, Michael. You're a member of Team BCPS. <laughs> and next is for the uh, literacy specialist pre-K through 12 in the Office of English Language Arts. Currently right now a resource teacher in the Office of Special Education. That's Teresa Janak. <laughs> and Teresa, other than Megan Shea, who's back there smiling, uh, do you have any other family or friends here with you tonight? Congratulations, Teresa. 
And Mr. Chair, members of the board, I would look, uh, like to, um, I look forward to introducing our two additional members. Um, the manager of school safety is coming from the Maryland State Department of Education as a school safety specialist, and that's Dr. Michael Ford. And next is our coordinator of data strategy uh, for the Department of Research, Accountability, and Assessment, and currently right now, program evaluation manager for Baltimore City Public Schools, that's Dr. Monica Hetrick. So I look forward to introducing them to the board and the team um, in a little bit. All right, thank you, Dr. Nance. <coughs> Our next agenda item is new business and contract awards, and for that, I'll turn it over the, to the chair of our contract committee, Doc, Mr. Gillis. <laughs> Dr. Oh, Mr. Good. Gillis. I'm not a doctor. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. McDaniels. <laughs> so you're right. That's right. The building and contract committee met earlier uh, today and reviewed the items that are uh, referenced as K-1 through K-7. We thoroughly discussed each of the contracts uh, and the committee voted at the conclusion of the meeting to recommend all seven contracts to this board, three to nothing with one member abstaining. All right. And there, there may be some discussion, but I'll ask for a motion to get things started to accept, uh, approve items K-1 through K-7. Is there a motion? So it's been moved. Uh, we don't need a second. Is there any discussion at this time of those items? Hearing none, I'll add, um, go ahead, uh, Kathleen. Ms. Causey, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, I did just want to uh, say that I had submitted questions um, in advance, and I appreciate at the Building and Contracts Committee meeting uh, hearing the answers from Mr. Saris and Mr. Dixit, I would like to reiterate that it would be helpful to have those answers in writing as there's a lot of good information and um, especially for these larger contracts that are for millions of additional dollars, um, including one where we went over two million in, uh, in over the course of a three-year contract, is that correct? Uh, yes. Okay that it, it's really important for the board to understand uh, the, the full details of it so that we can make the best decisions for the system, but also to let our constituents that, that are paying these taxes knowing that we are trying to do the best that we can for the students and for the countywide with the dollars that we're spending. Um, so I do um, also want to say that I look forward to receiving an update of the stat spreadsheet. Um, and it was helpful to understand that the first contract, JMI 623-13, um, is not coming out of that stat budget, but is under um, the other categories. And I do um, feel that it is important for our school to invest in technology and infrastructure. Um, in the administrative functions, um, but also in, in the new schools that we are building. So thank you for that. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Birch. I just want to comment, there are two contracts uh, of interest to me. One is the Jesus Center Hoffman Elementary School, which is an expansion of the existing program. Uh, the state had received $15 million in 2015, um, and we'll be now, our, our school system will now be accessing this for an expansion of uh, that effort at Hawthorne, which is uh, the elementary school I attended, and I think it's going to be a very useful, productive means of having children come to school, school ready, uh, which is always a very, very good, good thing for all of us. The second thing is the contract about um, uh, baseball diamond mix. Uh, because I had the opportunity to speak with uh, Mr. Dixit uh, previously, previous to the meeting, I just wanted to say that uh, he was very helpful in the information he shared with me. Um, it always seems that, uh, from my experience on the Recreation and Parks Board, that Middle River Middle School never seemed to get its baseball diamond mix in time for the Little League baseball season. But Mr. Dixit has shared uh, information with me. So if anyone from the Middle River Baseball uh, uh, League, one of the commissioners, has any problems with dirt, getting diamond mix, which is a special mix because weeds won't grow in that diamond mix. And it's also, you can work it so it's safer to uh, play in. And that also relates to softball. So uh, with that in mind, I want to thank Mr. Dixit. Don't have any questions for you, but I know there's some information you're going to be getting to me so that we can make sure that the folks in the River Recreation Council will be able to get their diamond mix. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Yes, Ms. Causey. Mr. Saris, looking back over the notes, as I said, there's quite a lot that was covered um, verbally in the Building and Contracts Committee meeting, but you had indicated for uh, the contract JMI 60213 that the 
and, and just to make it clear to the other board members, that the uh, funding source was not labeled correctly, if you could clarify. Correct. The, um, that's a combination of both operating and capital funds. Uh, from the exhibit, the 9.3 million is an operating budget item, and the uh, $4 million for the new school construction is primarily an operating budget, or capital budget item, excuse me. Thank you. Is there any other discussion for, if, if not, um, all those in favor, please say, uh, I'm sorry, I'll state it again, uh, of approving items K1 through K7, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Saris and Mr. Dixit. Our next agenda item for the evening is new business, and we will be discussing the proposed school calendar for 2017 and 2018. And for that, I'll ask Mr. Duke and Dr. Mayo to come forward. Okay. Good evening again. Good evening. Um, as we prepare for the 17-18 school year, uh, we have three school calendars that we'd like to present to the board for review tonight. Um, according to um, Superintendent's Rule 6301, um, at the first October board meeting, we must present a calendar to the board, and by the first November board meeting, as, as Mr. McDaniel stated in his um, remarks, uh, opening remarks, we must um, approve a, a, a calendar for the 17-18 school year, or the, for each of the um, school years, I should say. So prior to the governor's um, executive order on August 31st, um, the calendar committee had recommended option A as a school calendar for the 17-18 school year, which is a pre-Labor Day start. Um, after the um, executive order that came out on August 31st, the calendar committee reconvened the week of September 13th, and they discussed options B and C, which you have before you as well. Um, both of those options are very similar. One has a five-day inclement weather, built-in clause along with a contingency clause and option C actually has a seven-day um, inclement weather um, built into that particular calendar. With option B it also we still Im um, embed the Jewish holidays um, which next school year is actually only one um, that will be um, this actually on the actual school school day the others are actually on the weekend. Um, so with both of those options actual option C excuse me um, the there's not as much flexibility, which is something the State Department asked us back in the, at the end of the 13-14 school year to make sure we're building enough hours within our school year to accommodate having the, num the number of hours that we need at the high school level, which is 1,170 hours of instruction as well as 180 days. Um, so with option C, we do not have a lot of a cushion, a lot of cushion to, um, since the school year must end on June 15th. Um, so with that information, you know, we actually have those three options that are presented to you today and we're actually entertaining any questions at this time. All right. Are there any questions from board members at this time about the uh, proposed calendars? Um, I did have one question uh, on item C. Um, was there any consideration uh, about uh, having school on April 2nd, which is I see we kind of eliminate uh, spring break, but um, we start school on that Tuesday, April 3rd. Was there any kind of discussion about having school on April 2nd? Easter Monday is one of the um, education article uh, mandated holidays. At, right. And um, is there a pro I mean, is there a process to appeal having school on a Comar holiday? There is a waiver process that can be uh, followed. Oh, it's, it's I'll, I'll defa article. Okay, education really. article, okay. Is it, I'm sorry. You there is a waiver process that can be followed. However, uh, you have to demonstrate um, a critical need in order to convene school on one of those uh, education article uh, identified holidays. Okay, thank you. Any other questions at this time? Um, Ms. Miller? Yes. Um, can you just run down? You gave us a little short synopsis of what the changes were between the three options, but I wanted to make sure that that was everything. If there's other 
differences, particularly between B and C, it was kind of hard to discern without going line by line through. Um, I know that B um, has only five inclement weather days, where C has seven. B has an end of year contingency, meaning the school year could be shortened if all the weather days are not used, but C doesn't have that. Can you explain why that doesn't? We took a different approach in, in B versus C. C is more akin to what we normally do where we build in the seven days and then depending on the usage, the superintendent uh, makes a determination as to uh, curtailing the school year and makes an announcement uh, as early as possible, usually around the late April, early May timeframe. Um, in option B, we took a different approach and we built in the sort of uh, declaratory, declaratory statement as to if X number of days are used or not used, or are used rather, then the school year would end on this date. And if it were this number of days, it would end on this date. So we don't leave it open um, to an announcement later on in the school year. We, we sort of pre-advertise it in the calendar. Okay, but that option some, could be me. used on either. Yes. Okay, so really I, I'm seeing the difference between B and C really just being one has five inclement weather days and one has seven. Well, there's, a few, right? there's a few differences. Um, in B, we have 189 student days to include the, the five inclement weather, and in C, we have 190 uh, student days to include the seven inclement weather. So if we were to use um, all of our inclement weather days in B, we would, that would bring us down to 184 um, student days, and in C, it would bring us down to 183 student days. Also, in um, option B, uh, we have uh, the teachers returning on the, the 25th, and then in options C, we have them returning on the 24th, which is a day earlier. Both of them, however, uh, with the built-in uh, inclement weather days, does not exceed the 191 contractual teacher days. Um, and the only other difference basically is that in option B, the system is closed for Rosh Hashanah, and in option C, it is a regular school day. Okay, um, and can you explain also that 189 and 190 days, they both leave us well over the 180 requirement? Correct. The problem that we have to do, uh, the problem is that we have to meet two criteria. One is the number of student days and the other is the number of student hours. And um, if we don't build in a cushion that exceeds the 180 days, then we are in, uh, we're running the risk of um, not meeting the hour requirement. Uh, a few years ago, uh, we did not use or we only exceeded our inclement weather days um, by one day. However, we had an exorbitant number of um, delayed openings to the tune of 26 hours, and that found us uh, below the hour um, requirement that MSTE uh, levies on all school districts in Maryland. That would be about four days, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, I know I have a bunch of questions here, so let me just kind of go through my notes here. Um, can you explain about professional development days? I'm only seeing one on the calendar. How is professional development being delivered? Um, we do have the teachers returning um, prior to the students returning, um, and there is professional development, um, system-wide professional development that occurs during that week. Um, there are also early release uh, from elementary and middle. Um, while some of those days are used for grade reporting and uh, data collection, um, some of those days can also are, and are also being used for professional development. Where we do have a problem is at the high school. Um, there's only one um, early release for high schools, um, and that is not for professional development, but rather for grade reporting and data analysis. So how many days are being allotted for professional development before school starts, and is it the same on all three options? Uh, yes, it is all, it's the same in all three options. Um, there is one day that's devoted to system-wide, 
Um, there is professional development at the school level, but that's um, determined by each of the educational leaders of the schools. Okay. Would it be possible to deliver professional development using technology? So they would sign into a web portal and teachers could potentially also do professional development kind of on their own time, but being paid? <laughs> well, the, the caveat that you levied at the end of that statement is the issue. Um, um, <laughs> to answer the first part of your question, yes, technology can be utilized to, develop, uh, to deliver professional development. The, the, the question then uh, arises as to um, whether it's required, uh, whether it's optional, and the fact that it, it most definitely would have to be done on their own time, which then has other implications from the standpoint of, of payment. Okay. Um, also, um, for option A, I'm understanding that a waiver from MSDE would be required in order for us to utilize that option. Correct. Um, and that waiver would be required every year. Correct. And um, there are certain conditions attached <coughs> to that waiver request that have to be met. Do um, we know what those conditions are yet? We don't know for certain. There are some, um, there's still some discussion going on, um, but uh, we've been given the indication that um, there would be specific criteria and requirements that would have to be met each year in order to, to submit and get a waiver approved for a pre-Labor Day start. And it's my understanding that MSDE is going to vote on the standards for that waiver at their October 24th meeting. Um, the, the information that I was given, because I did query MSD, and they told me that it was an item for discussion at, I believe, the October 25th meeting. 25th, okay. Um, so at least then we would have some idea, if they're voting on it, we would Hopefully. understand what they're putting forward. Okay. Um, and that, typic, that process to pass a regulation typically takes about three months. Uh, I couldn't comment on that. I'm not sure. Would there be time for us to um, to develop our calendar and also have that regulation process be completed? But at this point, I'll ask our general counsel, Ms. Miller, if you don't mind, to weigh in who can give us the difference between regular, regula regular regulatory process and then emergency regulations have to be given. Uh, Ms. Miller the state superintendent and principal counsel to the State Department of Education were present at the May meeting last week and indicated that these regulations would be issued as emergency regs and therefore okay. effective upon issuance. There will not be a comment period if they're issued in that way. Does that mean it, there would be... Excuse me, point of order. Could we just have Ms. Howie's comments on the microphone so that... Mm -hmm. Everyone can hear them, please. It, they're very helpful. If the regulations are issued as emergency regulations, they will be effective upon publication at the State Board's meeting. At this point, uh, according to Principal Counsel to the State Department of Education, they will be issued as emergency regs at the State Board's October meeting. So they would become effective on that October 25th meeting, potentially? Potentially, yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Um, and by the um, governor's executive order, it states that um, uh, LEAs would have to give a compelling reason to request a waiver. So um, was there any compelling reason that was developed by the calendar committee for including this option? The reason we included the option is because at the time that we had to present the options f for uh, submission to the board, it was still very unclear as to exactly what the waiver process would be, if there would be a waiver process, and whether or not jurisdictions would be given the latitude to start pre-Labor Day. So rather than being reactive, we thought it would be best to be proactive and provide the board um, and worst casing would be just to discard that option, but to provide the board with a pre and a post Labor Day option. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Ms. Brad had a question, I believe you remember yes. what it was. Um, so um, one of the uh, differences between B and C was talked about in the public comment, and that's having 
school in Rosh Hashanah versus not having school in Rosh Hashanah. Was there a particular reason one calendar did not have school off for that day? Um, I believe it was C. We could have gone ahead and, and closed the system on both, uh, both option A and option C. However, in option C, it would have reduced the number of student hours and a student day by one day. Mm -hmm. um, so we wanted to give the board the option of having uh, to making the decision as to whether or not they wanted to go ahead and close the system based on the number of student hours and the, and the margin um, that we built into the calendar. So as, as you will see, one has 23 hours and the other one has 16 and a half hours. So okay. that's a difference. And um, in regards to that, I'm not, I'm still kind of figuring out how the policy works, but seeing as there is a po board policy or a rule or what have you, do you have school off on those, that particular Jewish holiday, how would that work? Would we have to change the rule or change the policy in order to use option C? I don't believe it's in policy and rule. Mm -hmm. um, it is a practice that has um, been followed in Baltimore County for um, a good number of years, um, since the 1900s, 1990s rather. <laughs> um, and. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a practice that, um, that we have followed, the guidance that we have followed when we've put calendars together. This basically would be the first time that we would propose that the school system would um, be in session on the Jewish holiday. So to clarify, the purpose behind it was not to collect data as no. far as that. No, okay. I don't recall that it being discussed at the calendar committee. Um, it may have been discussed in, in some subgroup, mm -hmm. but it, I didn't hear that discussion going on. Okay. There was discussion around if we were to eliminate all uh, closures on all uh, religious observance days, that that would be a way to um, collect data. That we did discuss, but there was no... Specific. Yeah. Um, and then my other question is, um, in the status quo, how many professional development days are built into the calendar? Uh, it varies from year to year. Um, normally we have the, the one MSEA day that we close for professional development. We have professional development prior to the students returning to school for the teachers. Um, um, sometimes we do have professional development built in mid-year. Um, there was, when we started um, uh, the new evaluation system, I believe it was, uh, where we started some new curriculum initiative. Uh, we did build in additional days because of the fact that we were, um, there was more training that was going to be required for the, uh, the launching of that new curriculum. So typically there are more professional development days built into the schedule than in B and C, which only have two, uh, I believe? It's about the same. Frankly, probably. it's about the same. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I did have one question, I guess it would be for Ms. White. Um, in terms of um, educational opportunities uh, in comparing starting before and after Labor Day, uh, when we think about providing just what would be the best timing and, and uh, the educational program we're presenting, is there any advantage or disadvantage to one to A versus B and C? I do think that they both um, offer advantages and disadvantages, quite frankly. Um, it's always good for teachers to have uh, the benefit of professional development um, before the school year starts, but also during the school year as well. So again, it's, it's kind of six in one hand and half a dozen in the other, um, that teachers require and, and should have the benefit of professional development throughout the school year. All right, but as far as the students and testing cycles, anything like that, nothing would be significantly affected uh, with A versus B and C, I guess. With what the, the testing calendar? Well, I just, guess just how the, the timing that we have to provide education before any kind of tests come yeah, up. So I, I think what Mr. McDaniels is saying, this, the state has not given us ind any indication they're looking to change the state testing window. So if the board does decide to start after Labor Day, um, then you are not going to get any additional days built in before the park testing, SAT testing, um, and map testing that students would do throughout the course of the school year. Those windows would not change. Um, you know, in our superintendent circles, as we talk, we, at some point, I would hope we get to an idea of you know adding more time 
um, for students, potentially looking at our calendar almost as a year-round uh, calendar for students. I think either way we look at it, we always have to go back and make adjustments to our summer program because there is a such thing as a summer loss um, for our students. So we want to make sure that we're maximizing those enrichment opportunities regardless of how long the summer is. Um, but I do think it's a conversation that, you know, with the state not adjusting its assessment window, College Board not adjusting its assessment window for AP or SAT testing, um, you're not getting any additional days uh, for students. And also, I know that the topic of professional development has come up, and unfortunately, we've had to limit the number of professional development days unfortunately here because of the length of our high school day so as dr. Mayo and mr. Duke talked about we need 90 additional hours for high school so in some cases when you look at the calendar elementary and middle teach uh, middle school teachers have those days off high school teachers have to go to school those days just because we have to capture those hours for students there are times throughout the year where data analysis are important we have to look at a curriculum adjustments for teachers where teachers actually regroup uh, their students at the semester we give our teachers that they're semesterized um, opportunities, time to plan for new courses. So professional development is important on the front end, as Ms. White said, but also throughout the school year. So we are limited because of the, 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 the limited high school day that we have for those PD opportunities for high school. But ultimately, I hope as a, a state, we would start having conversations about adding more time for students when possible. Thank you. Thank you. Any, yes, Ms. Causey. Hi, um, I had a question. Well, actually, I have three questions. Uh, so the first one is um, around the uh, orientation for students entering the sixth and ninth grade. Um, so I had heard uh, mixed feedback on that uh, program. I had heard some good things about it, and I had heard some uh, negative things about it um, from families about it cutting their time short, having to make uh, special arrangements uh, for the half day. I also heard from some teachers that it cut into their preparation time. So one of the things that I was wondering is if uh, any type of survey was done to parents and students and teachers to see about the value of that time. I know some schools have historically done this as an evening type program, a PTA um, or the school sponsored kind of an open open house where the students come in and they go through that same sort of thing for their ninth grade. Um, and I'm just wondering if that might be an option because I understand from um, Ms. White that of course the preparation time for the teachers in advance of the school starting is a very important time. And also if we're talking about having a limited number of of hours um, that we want to use those most wisely. So was there any type of survey done? And if not, could there be? And even if we approve a calendar in November, maybe it could be contingent on a, a survey. Yes, yeah, certainly we can take a look at a survey. We did um, go out into schools and we do have anecdotal feedback from teachers and from principals stating that they saw more of a benefit uh, to those transition uh, days. As actually, the survey was done ahead of time in, in terms of surveying and getting uh, feedback from students who had been through the transition before and wanting to know um, and asking us to build this in for uh, students who are coming up and those rising sixth graders and the rising ninth graders. When we asked them what, will we, what should we have done differently, this is one of the suggestions that we got on the front end, asking for this extended time for students so that they could become acclimated to their schools. So we did get uh, positive feedback. Again, it was qualitative. Um, and we don't have a quantitative measure at this point, but we can certainly take a look at that. And maybe to see in terms of the program uh, what any um, hitches might have been just because it was a new program. Uh, I heard some things about buses and, y you know, the times and so forth. So th that might be helpful. Ms. Kelsey, one thing if I could add to that too, um, in looking at uh, B and C as options, adding an additional day on the front end for teacher professional development would allow our teachers an additional day to make up for classroom preparation and things like that to get ready for the school year. It also, and I know in talking to, and Mr. Smith might be able to add more, in talking to Mr. McCray, it gave us an opportunity to work out any issues we might see with transportation as it was live routes for drivers. Thank you. Uh, and the second question has to do with the hours in the high school day. Um, what are the other, how, sh how much shorter is Baltimore County's high school day than other systems in Maryland? We are the um, shortest. We are. <laughs> <laughs> if, if we can send this out to the board. I don't want to quote any other school systems, Ms. Causey, but we can send it out to the board where every year MSDE will rank um, every single school system, the elementary, middle, and the high school hours. Uh, Baltimore County is the lowest, but we're, we're not like, you know, 30, 45 an hour off, but we are, we are in fact lowest. We'll send it out to the board in this weekly update. 
Okay, because I mean, what I'm hearing, and I was hearing this last year before the before Labor Day start issue came up, and it's you know the number of hours in the high school day affecting the the calendar, and if we have this horrible weather like we did that one year and we had so many delays where you're missing the hours but not necessarily missing the day, that maybe we just need to take care of that issue. Not only uh, to take uh, the hardship out of the, the, the calendar, but also if there's other schools in the county that's, that um, have additional hours per year, it, especially at the high school level, those students will be having, one would consider, more classroom instruction in those very courses where the students are somewhat competing in terms of advanced placement and even in uh, the general high school requirements. So I mean we could do one of, we can add to the hours in the day to address the calendar issues and also the students getting a uh, similar number of hours of instruction per year uh, for those very important high school years. We could also consider going back to a seven period day schedule which when we only have 24 credit hours that are required to graduate, having eight credits per year is not necessarily needed. Um, so there's ways to increase instruction time for our students, and, and I think that we just need to evaluate that um, because it is important to get that in and it is important to allow the schedule to have professional development days. Um, so if we can address that issue, and I know it's a financial issue, it's a budget issue, but again, I feel the teachers are already doing that extra work, so to help our high school students uh, meet their curriculum requirements, so I think it would be good for us to, to actually address that issue. Um, so the third question is, at the start of the next school year, how many thousands of students will still be without air conditioning if we are successful in the accelerated air conditioning plan? I don't have the exact number in front of me, but we'll be down to only 13 schools. So we can put that in the board's weekly update. I don't want to throw a number off the top of my, of my head, and, and I see staff looking, and I prefer us just to send that in the weekly update as opposed to giving you a number. But it's 13 schools, which is published online. 13 schools published online, but the number of students is not published online? No, ma'am. Okay. Can that item be added to the minutes that Debbie would attach to this meeting? I'd have to look at council. We didn't talk uh, about it. Yeah, if we can didn't talk about it, it wouldn't be in the minutes. But and we the can. The minutes are video. Okay, but we also have documents sometimes that are attached. We to don't the... put things that we didn't discuss in the minutes. Okay, is there an estimate from? I, I would prefer staff not give an estimate. I, we have 13 schools. We will make sure it's included in the board's weekly update. Okay, how many of those schools are high schools? We were, I, honestly, Ms. Collins, At I, least we were, four. I, I would prefer to put that in a weekly update. I was not prepared um, for an AC conversation on calendar, so unfortunately, I apologize. It will be in the board's weekly update. Can we wait till Friday again? Sure, that's fine. It, 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 it won't be uh, available to the parents, but it's certainly a part of the conversation, should be a part of the conversation, because historically, August is seven degrees hotter than September, and historically, and uh, August also has an extra hour of sunlight every day, which continues to bake those greenhouse schools. So for some people, it is a very important consideration. Thank you. Mr. Gillis. Two questions. One is, as I look at A versus B and C, it appears there's only one additional professional development day on A that isn't on B and C. And that's so, as we talk about professional development okay. days, we're really talking about day. Correct. Correct? That's correct. January um, 19th. Yeah. Okay. And second, um, we can't be weather forecasters, and uh, surely there's one thing we can't be certain of is what the weather's going to be next winter. Um, but do you all have for us some kind of, kind of historical summary about how many weather days we've needed in years past? So to me, the difference between five days and seven days built in for weather doesn't seem like a big deal, um, especially if we only use five days. But I don't know whether we use five or six or seven or more. Uh, in the 12-13 uh, school year, we used four. In the 13-14 school year, we used nine. In 14-15, we used eight. And in 15-16, we used eight. And in 13-14, in we had 14 hours worth of delayed openings. And then in 14-15, we had 26 hours in delayed openings, mm -hmm. plus additional hours in early releases. 
Oh, thanks. He was ready for that. Yeah, he was ready for that one. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Any other uh, questions? Yes. <laughs> I'll have to get back to you on that one. <laughs> All right. All right. Brain properly. All right, uh, if there are no further questions, we thank you very much. And again, I'll remind the public that uh, on October 25th, there'll be an opportunity for public comment on the calendar, and we will be receiving input from uh, stakeholders on the uh, website and our email address. Ms. Miller? I have one more question. Will the calendar committee be meeting until, until we vote so that further input can be taken into consideration at some of the suggestions? Uh, there is no meeting scheduled at this time. Uh, we've, uh, we met um, an additionally to consider a post-Labor um, Day calendar and then we developed the two options for you, but there is no meeting scheduled at, at this time for the calendar, meeting, uh, the calendar committee to reconvene. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. I'm not sure who this question is for exactly, but if, uh, if the board or board members wanted to uh, make suggestions based on the community feedback to adjust one, one or more of the options to be considered. When would be the time to do that and, and what would be the process to do that? Hmm. Well, well, again, one thing I will say, and we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit, um, I've asked Ms. Decker to compile the input that we receive from um, stakeholders over the next weeks and days. We certainly want to hear the public comment uh, at that point, and I guess there should be some time that we, between October 25th and when we vote, that we can submit thoughts and comments so that they can be incorporated into our decision making. And again, I don't know exactly, you know, what cutoff date that will be, but we certainly want to give the public some time to give us uh, feedback. So, uh, so as you, you can, as I, I know you can submit them now, but again, as we get input from stakeholders, we all also want to ha give ourselves time to incorporate those thoughts in what we're considering. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. As, as staff is leaving, I did email uh, the board what we just received through uh, the Public School Superintendents Association of Maryland. There's a revised governor's order that addresses this issue that was issued this afternoon. Right. Um, so I did email the board that so you have it in your records as well. And we'll also include that in your weekly update if so you'll have it. Okay, thank you. All right, um, our next item on the agenda is uh, board committee updates. Um, I'll just go around quickly. Uh, Ms. Johnson, do you have anything on curriculum? Curriculum committee met on September 15th. We were presented with a response to the STAT end of year evaluation from the Johns Hopkins Center for Research and Reform in Education. Uh, there were four areas addressed. Professional development from STAT teachers and administrators. That was area one. So professional learning will continue to focus on instructional design, including formative assessments, small group instruction, and the use of BCPS1. In addition, professional development is provided to participants in cohort groups throughout the course of the year and through summer institutes. The role of uh, number two was the role of the STAT teacher. The new organizational structure provides opportunity for community superintendents and their staff to work with principals throughout uh, uh, principals around the role and responsibilities of this very important position. Number three is we discussed a uh, technological technology a technology integration model. A model called TPAC is used to examine technology integration into curriculum and instruction. This model looks at an intersection of content knowledge and technological knowledge. Student and then lastly we looked at student device use. The launch of Growing Up Digital, a website provide, which the website provides all stakeholders, including teachers, administrators, students, and their family with information regarding uh, responsible technology use and the device care. So our next meeting is October 20th. This meeting will mainly be dedicated to the passport evaluation um, conducted by the Center of Applied Linguistics. 
and we are proposing, I haven't spoken to the rest of the committee members, but we're proposing to move the November meeting to, from November 17th to November 15th, and during that meeting we're going to discuss um, some some frequently asked questions on the grading and reporting policy and how we communicate best practices to teachers. Additionally, I hope to have, um, I hope to present the staff with some questions that came directly from students, parents, and teachers. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Um, I don't know, Ms. Miller or Mr. Gillis on the safety and technology committee? Or? Yeah, I'll just say, and I'll let Ms. Miller um, uh, speak. Um, we have a meeting scheduled for, I think, November 1st. But uh, go ahead. Yeah, I don't know if that's actually been moved yet, but it, it was um, October 19th. It's going to be November 1st now. Um, I gave an update at the last time, so I just wanted to add in what I've requested for that next meeting. I have requested the following uh, preliminary figures on time students spend on their devices in school and in doing homework, um, recommendations regarding screen time, the number of BCPS vendors which will still be operating under the old data sharing agreement one year and up to five years from now, um, data on device loss and damage and how that's tracked, um, a discussion about a stat privacy policy which would include what data is collected, with whom it's shared, um, who has access, how it's used, for what purposes, and an opt-out process and a discussion on the effectiveness of BCPS policies, practices, and our opt-out uh, 6202A in protecting students from the posting of student images on social media. Now, this was discussed earlier, um, and, and there was some public comment on it. Uh, the inappropriate posting of student images by BCPS staff on social media has now been written about by media outlets locally, by a data security blogger in Oregon, and now internationally by an outlet in the UK. Um, this is an urgent matter, and um, BCPS is being used as an example of what not to do when it comes to this practice. So I hope that we'll be able to make some good progress in addressing this as soon as possible. Thank you, Ms. Miller. I think that's it for our committee updates. Uh, An update, but the next PRC meeting oh, is, sorry. that's okay, is um, the 17th, uh, is next week at 5.30 p.m. in the E building, room 114. Thank you for that. All right, our last agenda item for the evening is uh, board member comments. I'll start with Mr. Virch over there. He looks like he's ready to comment on something. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, although I think I went first last time, uh, be that as it may. Um, on Monday, Senator Klausmeyer and I will be uh, meeting uh, with uh, Golden Ring Middle School uh, Principal Lawrence Rudolph, Dr. Dr. Lawrence Rudolph, and we'll also be meeting with uh, the Community Superintendent George Roberts uh, at Golden Ring Middle School, and we'll be visiting and touring the school during the school day. I look very much forward to, to doing that. Um, it's one of the schools in our sixth district, and uh, middle school is a very important important time for our students, and that school is an important resource for this system. What day was that again? I'm sorry. Monday. Monday, okay. Thank you. What are you doing? I might, I might try to join Okay. <laughs> Ms. Miller? Yes, hi. I have two comments, and, and I just wanted to say a little bit more about the issue of students' images being posted on social media. Um, two meetings ago, I, I talked about this issue during board comments. We need to ensure that our privacy policies and opt-out form adequately protect our students and families and that those policies are being followed. Um, just so that the public knows, um, unless you opt out using Rule 6202 Form A, your student's image can be posted on social media by BCPS teachers and staff. Um, and I, I'm going to request now to add an, an item to our next meeting's agenda called Student Images on Social Media. I hope that we can discuss that issue um, and get an update on uh, how the staff is going to be, how uh, BCPS staff is being educated on that issue. My second um, point 
Um, I had an idea which I think would be immensely helpful to the board, which is to establish a new board advisory group of former BCPS teachers. The purpose is to use system knowledge and industry experience to make suggestions to improve BCPS. So that would be people with the knowledge and experience to be able to advise the board, but none of the constraints hesitations that current uh, teachers may have. Um, I find that BCPS would pay consultants good money for the kind of information and advisement that our teachers are willing to give for free if they felt that they could do so safely. Whether or not the board elects to adopt this idea in a formalized way anytime soon, I would like to do it now in an informal way to advise me. So I invite any interested former BCPS teacher or other staff member who has left the system within the past two years to please contact me. Your service would be greatly appreciated and valued. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Johnson? Good evening. Um, so be smart, don't start. That was the anti-bullying mantra for the school system and all of our students um, this past week, and I'm sure it's going to be ongoing. And our young students get it. Our kids know how to respect each other and their time. We have important work to do as board members. However, we are constantly impeded from what we are trying to work, to work on on this board for our students and for our teachers in the county. I'm frustrated with the self-serving intentions of my seatmate, Ms. Miller. But one thing that I have learned while attending Q the CUBE conference last week, which is the Council for Urban Boards of Education, is that there are three groups of people. There are the engaged, which represent most of this board. There is the disengaged, which is pretty self-explanatory. And then finally, there's the actively disengaged. Those folks the actively disengaged will most likely not affect any positive change in, in their future and in the, in the, their tenure on any organization. And they are most definitely not champions for public education and for the students in our public education system. So I say this to you, Ms. Miller, you can hold my record next to yours anytime because I have visited schools throughout the county inside and outside of my district with air conditioning, without air conditioning, schools that are filled with children of color, schools that are filled with white children. I've had one-on-one -on -one and face-to-face -face conversations with many principals, teachers, parents, and students. I have not used my position as a board member to intimidate staff to get what I want. I have taken school tours, attended ribbon cuttings, attended professional development with teachers, actively participated in my two committees, and sought additional education as a board member and I will continue to do so. I will continue to speak up for the parents and the students who don't have the capability to speak up for themselves. I will listen to the parents and the teachers with knowledge and wherewithal to come to me as a board member and as a parent of children in this system. Because when we say all means all or all of our students deserve an education, that is not specific enough anymore. I will not respect the comments you made that are, in my opinion, discriminatory towards Latinos and the LGBT, uh, LGBTQ community. I will use my seat to make sure that just because you're in a certain zip code, that does not determine your level of education in this county. I will continue to respect my fellow board members, their opinions and their insight and their time. I will use my vote to further the equity that we have already started in this county and I will make sure that we work towards having central AC in all of our schools. And I ask you to have a conversation with someone that has actually had their civil rights violated and then ask them if they feel like not having central AC in a school is a violation of true civil rights. The bottom line is I will honor my oath as a board member to assist in running the school system and not attempt to create a system of individual schools from behind my computer screen or my Facebook page. I hope to see you at the Westtown ribbon cutting on Thursday. Um, and this finally to our Deer Park parents. We have to do better for Deer Park as a community, its students and their outst the other outstanding teachers there. I'm sorry and I'm sad for the students that were directly affected. And I'm scared for the students that this teacher still has in contact with. Thank you. Thank 
you, Mr. Collins. Sometimes it's, uh, it's time to be quiet. And I think right now for me, it's time to be quiet. So I wish you all a good night. And I have a deep respect for uh, all the members of the board. And I have a special deep respect for my seat met, made to my immediate right. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, Mr. Gillis, any comments for tonight? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, you heard from Mr. McDaniels in his opening comments about uh, this board having an opportunity to go to the Maryland Association of Boards of Education uh, conference this past week. Uh, those of us who attended had a great opportunity to uh, learn things about board governance uh, and uh, boards working together for the common good for public schools. Uh, and it was a, a very worthwhile uh, experience for, uh, for all of us. Um, it's also an exciting time for the school system uh, as in the coming days we have three ribbon cuttings. Um, we just heard about uh, uh, West Town on Thursday and next week Catonsville and Westchester. Uh, so um, these are indeed wonderful times and our county and our state government are spending their dollars in the right place as we continue to improve uh, our um, bricks and mortar for our kids. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Gillis. Ms. Causey? I had comments prepared. I'm going to have to add a little bit. Uh, so if you'll bear with me. Um, I wanted to start and talk about the National Blue Ribbon. As the superintendent pointed out, Hereford High School and Carver School for the Arts have uh, gotten the National Blue Ribbon Award recently, and we're pr very proud of both of them, of their uh, students, their families, uh, their teachers, the administrators, uh, the programs that they have in place at those schools um, that help them to achieve to such high levels, um, and that uh, you know we need to look to the, the schools in our system that are having success and try and uh, repeat that in other places so that other s schools can also achieve that high level for their students. Uh, next, I did want to say that uh, it was um, great to be at the MABE conference. That's the Maryland Association of Boards of Education. It was a time to meet with fellow board members and also network with board members and superintendents from other districts around Maryland. Um, we did, as Mr. Gillis talked about, learned about, more about governance and working together as a board for the benefit of our students. And I think that we all need to understand that we all come to the board uh, with the desire to help the students and the families of Baltimore County and Baltimore County Public Schools, and that although we have differences, we can disagree, but we do not need to be disagreeable. And I would hope that we can continue to work with each other to, to find ways to appreciate diversity in all aspects, including diversity of opinion and diversity of engagement. Uh, with that said, I would also like to thank Kevin Smith for attending and representing BCPS administration. One of the uh, workshops that I attended was the changing landscape of school construction. And one uh, very important takeaway was the importance of sufficient budget for facility maintenance and repair, because our schools will do better and last longer and cost less over time if we you know, take the time to spend now what we need on a weekly and monthly and annual level instead of letting the schools get dis uh, repaired to such an extent that they really need major renovations. So hopefully that as we move forward in our budget process that that is thoroughly discussed and that we have a really um, robust and realistic number of what we need in the facility maintenance and repair budget. And I know that our staff there does an amazing job with uh, the budget that they have, but certainly uh, we hope to hear what are the realistic needs for the future. Uh, the next, I was uh, had the opportunity to meet with a Department of Agricultural representative that was there, talking about the many jobs available in agriculture in all different sorts of um, uh, subject matters. Um, and it's interesting because I am the board member that represents Hereford High School, which has an outstanding agricultural program. Um, and to that end, I also recently was um, sent a notice. I'm on the email list for the Maryland Agricultural Resource Council, and they sent out an email talking about a um, very interesting teacher open house that they have. It's called the fourth annual Teacher's Night on the Farm on October 20th. 
from 4 to 6.30 p.m., and that's at the Baltimore County Ag Center on Shawan Road in Cockeysville. And it's a free event, but they'd like you to register. Um, and they're online. You can find them at the uh, Maryland Agricultural Resource Council. Excuse me, it's the MarylandAgriculture.org. Um, and it's an open house. You can come and take a tour, interact with farm animals, uh, enjoy local farm fresh food and drinks, including fruit of the vine. So if you want to take some teachers with you and have a little happy hour out on the farm, they have uh, wonderful resource materials available that you can take with you to help uh, interest your students in all of the careers that are available in agriculture. Um, and also to, uh, to let everyone know that when we think about agriculture, we think, oh, well, there's you know a few jobs that are out there. But as is pointed out, in the next five years, there'll be 58,000 high-skilled agriculture jobs open in the United States with only 36,000 graduates in related fields. For, so for all those students that are going to colleges and they're not sure what they want to do yet, they might want to look into one of the many fields that's available in agriculture. Um, also, as the calendar issue is discussed and moved forward, I've been um, uh, contacted by uh, families that have been involved in the agricultural program, and there are a number of issues that uh, make it difficult for them to start before Labor Day, including finishing year-long projects that uh, wrap up at the Maryland State Fair that happens the week before Labor Day. Um, also, I wanted to comment briefly on the park testing. We did receive uh, uh, a brief analysis from Dr. Dance, and I wanted to ask that if uh, that information had been sent to the State Board for evaluation, because it does uh, talk about some discrepancies in the testing, and certainly this board and the other boards in the state of Maryland should understand what those differences are in the mode effect. Is it the mode effect? Is it that, as Dr. Dance was saying, that there is a difference in the level of rigor in the pencil and paper test versus the computer test? Because until we get an understanding of what exactly is happening in that testing, we don't know how our programs are working for our students. If we don't have these uh, standards that we can say, are we making progress for these students? How are we making progress for our special needs students? Are we making any progress for our ELL learners? Uh, there has to uh, be some evaluation so that we can look at these numbers more critically and allow them to help us understand what's happening with uh, the budget items that we have, all of the money that we're spending on, on STAT and other initiatives, how are they helping our students achieve? In that same regard, uh, the SAT scores, I'd like to see a, uh, an analysis of that system-wide because as the test has changed this year, it's going to go to a new, a, a, a different caliber. So it would be nice to look back in the past and see what our trend was, and then we're going to be starting over. Um, also on transportation issues, I wanted to thank Mr. Kevin Smith and Mr. David McRae for analyzing stops and starting to, make, starting to make the changes that improve safety for our students. Hopefully other issues that have been raised by parents will also be reconsidered and then follow-up sent out to parents and principals. Hopefully the next update from transportation will address if budget pressures are the underlying reasons for changes to so many bus stops. And as the administration works on the budget, we need to understand how overall budget priorities affect this very important aspect of transporting our students safely. Because I'm still hearing concerns from parents about unsafe bus stops, longer walks to the bus stop, longer ride times to school, and crowded buses. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Eaton? It is very upsetting that a few teachers are giving Baltimore County Public School teachers a bad name. The teachers I am referring to are the ones who do not use common sense when using social media as they discuss their students, other teachers, and principals. What are they thinking? Teachers are well educated in their areas of expertise. However, some really lack common sense and social media etiquette. Therefore, the school system needs to develop a workshop or at least a corrective program for those who need to learn and follow the proper social media protocol when posting. If you do not have anything nice to post, don't post anything at all. You are the student's role model. You are the stewards of our school. Please demonstrate proper behavior. My next point is about parents being able to opt out 
from having their children's images being used in teachers' postings. However, opting out of social media posting should not preclude their children from getting their school or class pictures taken. These are two entirely different situations. On social media, anyone can view. With class and school pictures, only families involved can view them. I just learned tonight that the PRC will be discussing this very issue. Let's draft a new permission slip allowing the parents to opt out of all social media postings but still be able to participate in class and school pictures. Thank you. Mr. Stewart. Thank you. <clears throat> so I wanted to share a few thoughts tonight with the BCS community, BCPS community, about the importance of what we do here. And I would ask that Ms. Ann Miller may hear my wards. It's sad that it has to be said again, but here it goes. Please remember that advocacy for yourself is not the same as advocacy for children. The amount of likes you get on your Facebook page does not correspond to how effective you are in promoting children. As an aside, to suggest that the rest of us are here only for our self-interest, when you're the only one with a public Facebook page as a board member and the only one trying to advertise for it to gain likes is hypocritical at best. As board members, we are citizen servants. My mother, who battled cancer for five years and passed away as you were issuing your latest attack on board members last week, taught me that public service is about finding common ground. It's not about finding the things that divide us or about trying to drive wedges between people. It is about representing the people you serve and about finding a way to make progress on their behalf. It's simple, but it's a lot harder to dig into the details, to try and build consensus, and to engage in the push and pull of policymaking. That kind of effort doesn't generate attention. We know that. But it's why we're here, or at least it's why we should be here. Our work is too important to do otherwise. I understand that insulting others, that bullying staff, that attacking board members may get you more attention, but it's not a recipe for results, and it never will be. It's a recipe for ineffective representation and for wasting one of our most precious resources in this life, time. And we spend too much time listening to your conspiracy theories and your McCarthy-like demands for investigation. You don't have to agree with everything that other people say, but you do have an obligation to try and make progress. If you don't, then the only reason you're here is to elevate your public profile, Facebook or otherwise. Let's reject that thinking, board members, and let's get to work. Thank you. Statement, because I think the public has a right to know what uh, we, is being discussed by these two board members. Ms. Uh, Ms. Miller, with the that's attacks that they're saying, uh, I have launched. We, we're going to adjourn our meeting. This is, not a, this is not a part of our meeting at this point. We have uh, just a few announcements for the evening. Schools are closed tomorrow. There's a system-wide development day on Friday, October 21st. Schools are closed for students. And our next board meeting is Tuesday, October 25th here at Greenwood. Thank you.